the rest of the day, um, the first uh, part, and maybe we'll take 30 minutes and see how, I, I think we might probably need more than 30 minutes, 30 or 45 minutes to debrief from yesterday um, and go over some of the proposals for the parole issue and the 1170D issue that we discussed and set priorities for uh, committee staff. That'll be the first part of our conversation. Um, and then for after that, we will um, the, the committee will come back and report back to us on the research that they've done on the proposals and priorities that we've set from past meetings. And they have about eight proposals that have been sort of honed down based on our comments and feedback over that period of time. Just so we all know what we're uh, aiming for in terms of um, making a proposal schedule is that uh, I hope that at our next hearing in December that we will have and be able to vote mm -hmm. on a series of proposals uh, to adopt and that between December and mid-January, the committee will write those up into a report that we will formally adopt in full in January. So that's kind of the tentative or a little bit more than tentative schedule. All right. So uh, because have, time is, go I ahead. I have to jump off for hopefully just no more than 15 minutes, but it might be 20 and then I'll come back. For those, I, there's a bunch of us that have to jump on and off and Justice Moreno obviously isn't here. So um, I, will, I will personally catch folks up and make sure everybody feels up to speed um, because this is important stuff. So yesterday we obviously talked about parole in 1170D. I'd like to start with the parole piece first and hear people's reactions. I think the two main problems that seem to be uh, of concern to be addressed were um, the standard being um, confusing or um, ambiguous, or at least not focused on the right priorities, meaning violence, um, and to uh, issues about uh, arbitrariness and things like insight and the subjectivity that's part of the process. Um, I was wondering if people have reflections or thoughts before I go with my own. Don't make me call on you, Dean. Don't let, make me cold call on you. That might be the most effective way, <laughs> Chair. Okay, go. Okay. I, I know. I, you know what I tell my what I tell my students is that I like cold calling in part because sometimes people don't have the best answers, and that's okay. And then you see everybody else doesn't have the best answers. But right. I, okay, no. I'm going to go with you because I know you have <laughs> ideas. So here we go. Uh, the parole standard, the parole standard, take either the standard or the objectivity issue. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts and priorities might be. Um, yes, no, I, I think we need to um, address both, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, what I've been struggling with, as I said in you know, the comments both days, is what are the most impactful changes that we can recommend. So I, I like the discussion that we had yesterday about how we have moved away from presumptive, that's too strong a word, but the presumption of parole. Um, and we have moved away from that. And so I'm now wondering how we as a committee can address that, how we can create more incentives, more presumptions, for people being released on parole. That, that, that's where I'm at. And I, I don't know if we can just do that, <laughs> right? Like, can, can we? Um, so that's my problem, Chair. Um, I want to share my screen for a second. Tom, do I have share screen capability now? I have granted like you that special power, yes. It look, looks like it. All right, hold on one second. That's not what I want. And I'll keep talking while you're doing that because the subjectivity yes. problem is always a double-edged sword, right? So on the one hand, we want to think about reducing subjectivity uh, because of the issues of discretion that we talked about earlier and that some of the testimony we heard yesterday uh, discussed. 
But when you move away then from subjectivity and discretion, we have the other problem that people discussed yesterday, which is then we aren't able to take into account individuals' uh, characteristics. So, correct. So, problem. The, I don't know what the solution is. Um, at risk of jumping in here, there's two ways that I feel like we can address the subjectivity. First of all, here I'm putting up the, the various standards, the legal standards for parole, and that they, I think, are not necessarily coherent. Uh, the first is that parole shall be normally granted, right? That's A30, 30, 41, A2. The second is it shall be granted unless, considering the offense, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that there's a public safety requires longer incarceration. And then the regulation, which is an attempt to interpret and apply these statutes, says shall be found suitable unless they pose a danger to society. And danger to society is not defined. So one thing that we had discussed was um, whether that standard danger to society or th there should be a statutory uh, definition, meaning and probably danger to of committing a violent crime. Uh, my sense was from uh, from Ms. Schaefer's testimony was that she feels it's already de facto the rule. Um, so maybe actually legislating it wouldn't be that big of a change. I think it would be a si significant change. Um, another way would be to build in presumption. So for example, if somebody was found low risk by the, either the static risk assessments or the more dynamic risk of assessments, or if you haven't had rule violations the next number of years, then maybe we could, you could build in a presumption of um, suitability. Anyway, those are, those are some of the thoughts. Do other people have ideas or thoughts or comments? Yeah, this is Espinosa. I, I have to say that although I had a lot of exposure to the habeas process for people who were denied parole at one time, I'm not entirely, I haven't stayed current on the subject. It's been more than 10 years since I was in that assignment. But normally when there is a presumption, someone has a burden of proof overcome that presumption and it's, I'm looking at this language and it's not clear to me from B1 for example that there's a clear responsibility for people considering parole to articulate um, I don't know their reasons for denying parole and in my recollection of the law in the area as it was developing 10 years ago was that the sort of um, <clears throat> The current, the, 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 the facts, the gravity of the offense could not be used exclusively to deny parole, which doesn't seem entirely consistent with B1. I mean, it seems to me that there should be a, a stronger statement about what's required when using the facts of the current offense. I don't, I really, it's just not my area, but this doesn't seem like it places enough responsibility on the parole board and their decision-making process to clearly articulate um, their reasons for denying parole. And, and again, you practice in this area, so maybe I'm wrong. They, they have to give their reasons. Um, but I think as we heard yesterday is that there's a lot of subjectivity in those reasons. They say we continue to see criminal thinking and lack of insight or lack of remorse. Um, I mentioned a case yesterday where this danger to society expands to, I have had a commissioner say, you know, it, running traffic signals and speedings are dangerous to society. The vast majority of recidivism, as we know, um, are these low, are misdemeanors and um, also getting to what you're saying, uh, Judge Espinosa, about presumptions is that in other contexts, the Supreme Court has interpreted similar uh, statutory language. So shall do something unless there's another condition that that creates a presumption on the shall, shall do A unless B, and that would put the burden on uh, the parole board, I guess, to deny parole, but that presumption is not explicit here. That's just a judicial interpretation of similar 
language. Um, the, the most black and white proposal, I think, along these lines is to say risk of committing a violent crime or even a felony. I mean, that's not, e it's not even, a felony isn't even specified. Um, I don't know, what, what, do, does, does risk of committing a violent crime go let out to too many people? So let's say the parole board says, uh, I, I have really concern here that you're going to uh, do drugs again and um, become homeless and, and break into cars, but I don't think that you're at risk of committing a violent crime. Is that somebody who should get parole? Yes. Yeah, it's not a crime to, two of the three of the things you said isn't a crime. And, and I wanna add to that, I mean, I. And, and this is just a philosophical uh, question or observation. We are operating under this fiction or the parole board is operating under a fiction that we can really predict future behavior. I, I, I just think that that's a, we, 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 we can engage in probabilities, right? But we've heard from people and where those probabilities might have cut the other way. Like we just don't know, we can't, and, and what worries me then, uh, Chair, and this gets to your subjectivity point, is once we have this subjective language, like we do in B1 and 15 CCR 2281A, where it's not defined and it will be impossible to define, um, I, I think, where, where we say consideration of the public safety requires a more lengthy period of incarceration. Great, but how do you determine that? We have people who've never been incarcerated who will commit crimes. And so, the, the, and I don't necessarily think that just because you've committed a crime in the past, you will be more likely to commit a crime in the future. And thus, part of me just wants to say 3041A2 period. I know we can't do that because then we've given no, no, no criteria for the parole board to deny uh, parole. But in a one and a half hour interview and then just reading paper, I really would be surprised at people's ability to determine whether or not an individual is at risk of, of, of uh, is at well, risk of criminal conduct, uh, violent criminal conduct. That's my. Yeah. I mean, I guess my question is. I have confusion around sort of a conflation of outcomes and ideas, you know, and I'm getting more and more confused about the true goal of the parole board hearings. I mean, I don't know that you'll never be able to create a system where no one ever creates a crime. And so is that the goal? right to have folks only get out who will never ever commit a crime I, you will you can never determine that um so why not try to consider a recreation of this that parallels other sorts of evaluatory processes that are used to sort of determine um preparedness i mean is it about preparedness for life on the outside or is it about making sure someone never commits a crime you know there are 360 degree evaluation reviews there are peer reviews I mean there's sort of there are all sorts of things that I think could be you know integrated into this thing but you'll never be able to get subjectivity out of anything that involves human beings you'll never be able to have a holistic review if you only have certain kinds of folks on the boards on the hearing boards um, and you'll never be able to get the full scope of who someone is by just reading what you see on a paper so i just sort of question <sighs> why we're trying to put lipstick on a pig and just figure out you know like what the real animal should be and what the what what we want as the outcome i mean 
the other thing is if you have someone who's incarcerated for an incredibly long period of time, um, and I also question how someone else is able to truly determine what someone has learned or how someone has changed. You know, many, I'm sure all of us on this committee have figured out how to wrote study so that we can cram or prepare for a test to get us the outcome we need so that we can go on about our lives. And so, you know, sort of recognizing the role that that plays in this too. So, so go ahead. No, so I'm just saying I would, I'm thinking a little bit more expansively. I mean, I don't really understand the role that insight or remorse plays in this. I haven't for a really long time. I don't know that there's any sort of empirical data out there that suggests that it, it truly is a um, predictor. You know, I, I, I think the, the, the having discussions about how to prepare for these things is really important. So people have an understanding of what they're really used for. Cause I think most people feel like parole boards used to keep people back in rather than to sort of prepare them for what happens outside. Um, you know, I think everyone should have access to it, quite frankly. So the way that I see it is that we have two levels of subjectivity. There's the standard itself is subjective and not defined. What is requires a more lengthy period of incarceration, a danger or risk to society. These words are to some people mean some things and some means to others. I think that that's actually a fairly that part is the easiest fix. We could say a felony or a violent crime or a very violent crime or however you might wanna do it. The determination about whether or not they're going to reach that standard is another is the second level of subjectivity, which I think is difficult. And you know what uh, Mr. Watley was talking about yesterday about maybe eliminating the idea of insight. Now, one approach to, so on the first part about the standard, I think that we should explore, before we get to the, how do you determine whether somebody meets that standard, I would say that as a priority for the committee to have um, the uh, staff research whether, what, vi whether violent, risk to commit a violent crime is uh, an appropriate standard. Then we'll secondly, get to the part about how do you evaluate that? Is that something that we want to explore? Do we endorse that? So, so I think, why not explore it, um, Chair? So I would say, sure. Um, though, again, and, and maybe this gets to Assemblymember Kamlager Dub's point, right? Uh, the broader question she asks, I mean, it, it, it's sort of like minority report, really. How do we figure that out? <laughs> but that, but well, that's, I, that, that's, that's the second that, part. That's, that's the second part. part. Okay, yes. I, and I also tend to think, and maybe I'm being overly optimistic, I've said this a few times, that I think that statutory language can influence culture. And I think that if the legislature says, hey, we really are talking about violent crimes here and we put that in statute, I think that does change culture. So anyway, can we agree to vote on just the standard part? We're gonna to get to the evaluation part in a second that to explore and to look at other states, for example, if risk to commit a violent crime is the appropriate standard, just a statutory standard, and to clarify what, what we see in front of us here is. Can I add one more point actually to that point? Um, yes. So I don't know whether or not, since we've talked about Norway so much, do they have an equivalent system to- I don't either. Because I would love, because I would love to then think about: Do we model what they have clearly thought a lot about? Um, so maybe that's another thing to to, to research. I Here comes our expert. I, I I can't speak about Norway, unfortunately. And I think you know, once uh, we can travel again, maybe we should take a, a trip there, like everyone else has done. <laughs> um, uh, but I know that, uh, for example, Canada has various. Um, levels of release. So, you know, our system, it's like you're in or you're out. Uh, and there, and Canada, for example, has, okay, well, you're going to sort of, you know, have more privileges and more freedom. And then you're on a continuum. That's much more of a set, uh, you know, system for everyone to go through. So I think, you know, as 
is true of so many of these issues in our current system. This binary choice, um, you know, it's just very hard to bring that up into, you know, modern modern times. So there are, definitely are uh, systems of parole from other countries that have more graduated issues. Um, and on this whole issue, another person I spoke with about this, uh, she was talking about how, you know, when you graduate high school, you have to complete your classes and then you graduate. You, the principal then doesn't have to sit down with you and decide whether you, you know, are appropriate to graduate high school. And then when you apply to college, you are much more in a parole board process where you, you know, you can sort of say the things that the admission boards wants to hear. They're looking at a stack of paper, trying to make a future prediction of, you know, how, how you're going to do. Uh, and it seems like, you know, the high school model might be more appropriate for um, sort of the kind of decisions, decisions that were here uh, in that prison in any way sets things up like that, where you have, you know, things you can check off a box, you have classes, it's very much more regimented. So I'd offer that too, as a way to think about it. That, so that, that gets to the, I think that gets the second point. I'm trying to separate these out to try to have some coherent thinking. I do like the idea, and I don't know how complicated it is to have some sort of graduated, you know, maybe the parole board can assign people to level one yards or something like that, or special programming yards. Um, as an intermediate step or MCRPs or so I would explore that. Um, is there more on the standard part? Cause I really do want to get to the evaluation part which is trickier. Yep. Uh, Judge Espinoza, do you have a thought? I, I think that there seems to be some uh, momentum towards and as, and as I said, secretary, uh, I guess she's not secretary, but uh, Ms. Schaefer said that they basically already use violence, although nobody says that and it's not in statute. I, I, I do think that that would be a change. It would be a change for my practice. Um, anyway, I think we should explore that. The second question is how does one evaluate whether or not they're at risk for violence or whatever the standard happens to be? We've talked about, could there be a checkbox system right, where you're given a certain menu of things that you have to accomplish and that that's either given to you very early on in your incarceration. Some people said that that's the ideal time. Some people said, no, I'm not ready for it or it could be done. You know, there is this consultation that happens five or six years before your parole hearing. Um, and that if you complete that checklist, maybe that creates, if not automatic parole, some sort of uh, thumb on the scale or, or heavier presumption. Along the similar lines are, I know predict, you know, minority report concerns are out there. However, and we talked a little bit about the HCR 20, I mean, it's not a, it's not a completely, it's not a completely useless tool, nor are the psychiatric evaluations that are done by CDCR. Those are given no regulatory or statutory weight in these hearings, meaning if you are evaluated as being low risk by CDCR's own evaluation protocol, you go to board and the board reads those reports, but there is no, um, there's nothing in the statute of regula regulations that say, if you are de deemed low risk by CDCR, you shall be you know, presumed to be released in less extenuating circumstances. You know, you could imagine writing something like that. So now we're I'm trying to shift the conversation to how do we make the evaluations? You know, again, there were some talk about eliminating the idea of insight or remorse. I think that that's very, very difficult because that's just, you change one word and they're gonna come up with another word that essentially means the same thing. Um, anyway, so thoughts or reflections on, again, how to evaluate somebody's future dangerousness, and I'm using an intentionally vague word there. <laughs> I do like your last formulation about if CDCR has determined that a particular person is low risk, then there is a presumption of parole. Because certainly CDCR would have more information and, and people within the system would have more information than the board would. So CDCR currently runs three different risk evaluations on people before board. There is uh, actuarial 
of risk called the California Static Risk Assessment, which gives people a score of one through five. There is, they give people the HCR20, which is not, so the first one, the California Static Risk Assessment was developed by CDCR and UC Irvine um, to, as specifically for California inmates. HCR20 is a national model. It is, there, we should probably hear some more evidence about that, but there is a lot of scholarship on both sides about its value. Um, Keith Watley says, well, it's never been tested specifically in California lifers. That's probably true, but it has also been tested nationally. And I think it has, uh, well, anyway, I'm not an expert in it, but it's certainly a well-known risk evaluation tool. And then the third major evaluation tool that CDCR has is that prior to going to board, a, stat, a CDCR psychi psychologist does, you know, a two hour, three hour sit down interview with the um, prospective parolee and is, and this is also confounding in terms of the statute, makes a recommendation on violence. So you'll see it every one of these um, what they call comprehensive risk assessments, uh, whether a low risk, a moderate risk, or high risk of violence. Now, of course, the board doesn't take that as there's, first of all, there's no presumption, as we said, but also it doesn't even take violence as its true cause. So you could say if you get a low risk on any of them, on all three of them, hmm. those are the current risk evaluations, at least. And try, they're all trying to be a little bit more objective. And then they have the board meeting, which is, I think everybody would say is a very subjective, individualistic um, evaluation. Well, I don't know enough about all the three different risk assessment tools. So I, I, I guess I would not be, uh, I wouldn't object to a presumption based on any of them of a low risk finding, but but that's based on, but I have no information about the three different tools you mentioned. They have different levels of granularity and different problems with each of them. So yep. I just want you to know that. Yep. Assembly member Kyle Magradov. Well, I was just thinking that there, I mean, I, I, I understand the reliance on CDCR um, because you know, they're sort of the ones interacting with folks on a daily basis. But I also wonder if something can be gained from sort of expanding the pool of observers or assessors to, you know, counsel or, you know, just to some other kinds of participants. Because I have found that, and I get that not everyone has, you know, counsel, but in the instances where folks do, I feel like their attorneys also kind of have a reasonable um, perspective on someone's, you know, ability to perform, you know, once released. Um, I just kind of go back to some of the restorative justice models in terms of evaluation. Um, well, this brings up sort of one of the ideas that came up that I thought was particularly intriguing, but probably difficult to implement, but that doesn't, shouldn't necessarily stop us, is that if a, a parolee could, prospective parolee could call a witness. I don't know if that's towards what you were, the character. Yeah, I mean, I just, I think there, <clears throat> there, there are just so many other models out there that are a little more inclusive. Um, to sharing a person, you know, the quality and the intent of a person and their behavior. And this is just seems incredibly antiquated. So I was intrigued by that idea. Um, the, the witness idea. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And just sort of including other folks who have a sense. I mean, some of these folks are communicating with people on a regular basis. They, they can probably, you know, um, offer a better sense of someone's, you know, sort of change or evolution. Um, you know, I, I just. Uh. I, I, I would agree with that um, in terms of being able to call, 
witnesses. I was, I, I too um, really was impacted by that testimony about, especially the one, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name yesterday when she was talking about when she goes back to do the- Janae. The, exactly, right? And, and the corrections officers who are apologizing to her for the treatment and, um, but I, I just wanna take one huge step back and maybe this is not productive at all, but I keep going back to Anne's testimony today about the governing principles of people are redeemable, people can change, lengthy incarceration is counterproductive, right? So it seems that that should govern the way that we think about the parole system. And if we combine those three things with the fact that it is incredibly difficult. I don't know if there's any evidence out there about how good people's predictions are about one's future behavior. I would imagine that, that, that we aren't good um, at doing that and so many factors that we wouldn't wanna consider like race, gender identity, gender, right? All of those things will impact our judgments of future dangerousness. And then if I think about what Jay said about incentives is there a way of thinking about recommendations to the parole system and to the criteria and the statutes you just listed that operationalize these governing principles and create incentives for the behaviors that we want? That, that's the question that's going through my head right now. And I, I don't know how we do that. Do we create presumptions for release? Do we say, and, and this, there's no way this is gonna happen, but I'm gonna say it anyway. If the programming that is required that people have to go through in while they're in custody does not exist, then the presumption is release on parole at your first hearing. That would create incentives to create the programming within um, custody that allow people to prepare themselves for release from prison. Like that would be a, that would be, <laughs> that would be a presumption that would work, right? Cause no one wants that. I, I'm not talking about myself. I'm thinking about. No, I, I agree. I mean, one thing that didn't come up yesterday and it did come up a little bit with the discussion about geo group that's problematic about programming is that the auditor, state auditor did a report about most of this rehabilitation programming for all California prisoners, not just parolees and found that they were very poor uh, predictors of recidivism. So just because you participated and completed a program, it did not have any impact on uh, recidivism. Now this was not parolees, this was everybody leaving. And so yep. I think programming is what we all wanna say, but I, I'm not sure it is a panacea. And my only other feedback, Again, and this is the difficult problem I think that we're gonna face on so many issues is that we have these sort of general thematic ideas and priorities and principles that we want to influence. And I think that the voters generally support, but then make putting them into statute. Right. If we just put, if we replace some vague words with some other vague words, does that really do the trick? Uh, maybe it does. Um, but well, I think time is really important. I mean, I think time is- Excuse me, time? Mm-hmm. In what I way? Mean, how long before you're eligible? I mean, you, you just have to chop the thing off at the knees, big chunks, big chunks. So I, become I, eligible for, for, now Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it is difficult with some of the, well, can we get people to the board earlier or are those almost all protected by initiative? I, I think that's true in large part, but credits are a big answer here. Um, to, as that's one of the things uh, Taino was saying that, um, you know, let the credits go to that earliest release date. So if there was um, more expansive credits, more targeted credits to lifers, for example, um, that would be another way to, to do that that I think wouldn't present any of those initiative issues. So in other words, just to just to reframe that for a second, right? If the sentence is 20 to life, let's just pick an easy number, that's controlled by a statute that was you know, done by initiative and would be very hard to amend uh, without another initiative. We should also talk about future 
prospects for another initiative, maybe at a different conversation for 2020. But we could, one could increase the number of credits to reduce that 20 year time so that they do get to parole board earlier. So the sentence technically remains 20 to life, but you get more credits so that 20 year period is shorter in real time. I think so. I, I'd want to, you know, kick the tires on it more, but that's my impression today. Yeah. But so can we change the, all right. So like we heard today, things like the bar, burglary of a detached garage versus a uh, attached. So I, I think we need to start looking at whether there's changes there that don't trigger initiative. Um, so if, that, if we change the definition of the crime or the that underlying penal code, then uh, we may not need either the uh, to up, get up against the initiative requirement or a two thirds vote requirement. I mean, we right. did we're talking felony about murder, the for example, to have really done what we what we um, optimally wanted with felony murder, we would have needed the two thirds. So we carved the parts that were not impacted by initiative. Well, okay, for the parole to. Before we get on to the other things, we're just trying to keep on the parole standard for a second. So what I'm seeing, I just want to sort of list our priorities so we keep focused for the staff. Uh, first is, should the standard be risk of violence or something more definitive? The next, which I don't think that we've come to a resolution, is how does one make that evaluation? Is it a checkbox list? Is it a presumption if you're... Um, found low risk? Is it a, a new set of principles that we put into the penal code, right? And then the third is, is there a way to get people to board sooner, either through credits or redefining the crime in such a way that does not offend the two thirds uh, initiative vote process? Those are the three sort of main ideas that I've heard. Yes, Dean. So I, I don't know if this is possible because this is not my area, but let me just ask this. This is to the first point and, and the presumption point. So the, 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 the three statutes that you put up. So you get a sentence of 20 to life, just to use that example. And then assuming we can get you to the parole board more quickly in the ways that uh, we were just discussing, right? So 20 to life, we can get you to the parole board more quickly. Why then can't we just say and leave it at 3041A2? Now that you are before the parole board, you, you've gotten to that point more quickly you, there is a presumption that you will be granted parole period or comma. And then we put the burden on, not on the inmate seeking parole, but on the parole board, I guess, a, a high standard for why they should not be released at that time. So the 20 to life you get before the board at a particular time, presumption of release, unless the board by, I'm just using the reasonable doubt standard. I don't know what the language would be. They are able to demonstrate some high burden for why this presumption should not govern. Is we could, the word presumption is obviously nowhere in here. I know. So shall normally grant parole. We'll just leave no, it. No, but why don't, well, why, but normally grant, I think that that's part of the confusion. Yep. I think that the fact that there is no, like, I think this normally grant parole is, it's pretty unique to California penal code, if not statutory language in general. And I think that is part of the vagueness that's creating the issue. If we want a presumption, I think that we should say that there's a, a presumption. That's my, my feeling about it and we, not, go ahead, judge. Well, that was the point I was trying to make earlier is that th there really needs to be a clear presumption of parole. And I like the idea of setting forth a standard of proof. I don't think it could be proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but it could certainly be clear and convincing evidence. Something that, that courts reviewing these decisions can, can use to evaluate parole decisions because- um, okay. That leads to another question. Okay, so here, so good. I think we're making progress here. Um, I have a question. Do um, I'm sorry. No, go a, ahead. A can folks can incarcerated folks do they have access to files? Yes. 
and then B are the decisions behind the denials uh, wait, made public. Wait, 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 wait. Let's be clear. They have access to. They don't always have access to the full information in their file. No, that's that correct. Was the point of my last bill, which unfortunately was vetoed, is that you yes, can go but before the parole board. Hold on, you mm. can go before parole, and have presented to you things that, uh, quote unquote, violations that you had never heard before about. So yes, you can. We that's not quite. That's that. not quite accurate. That's not quite accurate. You have an indication that there has been something put in your file about a specific incident, but you don't know what the al underlying allegations are. So it's not like you're hit com completely by surprise out of nowhere that somebody's. So there is a receipt, essentially put in your main file that you have access to. That there's been a, something added to your confidential file, right? Which but you without any details as to what the incident was or when the incident was or Correct. any. Thing. So you Correct. can't. So in other words, you can't be prepared to address what it was while you're sitting before the parole board. Wow, that's absolutely that's that's absolutely correct. That's and ridiculous, and I have to go, but I will call back right. in. <laughs> Great. Then the second uh, question is, and yes. which is part of this, is are the denials and the logic behind the denials made public? Yes, but. You know, it's only us nerds who actually read those things. And I, and I, and, I, and just BPH's defense, this is actually Speaking a great thing to do. <laughs> Anyone can email and get a transcript of a parole hearing. You'll get it instantly. It's actually it's one of the most transparent things I've ever seen in anything for uh, criminal justice. Now, what's in those transcripts is tr often troubling, but the fact you can get them for free instantly is actually pretty uh, unique. So okay. uh, credit there, certainly. They have not, they, I mean, another thing that we could do is require, there's not a lot of data published on their website about overall grant rates, grant rates by commissioner. There's some reasons for that. Those are, those are some issues. And then um, the state appointed attorney, right? Unless yeah. you're able, so, so basically this person just goes from person to person to person to represent them just to make sure that so it's, it's, a, it's a very, very hard job. What's the current pay, Tom? 750 total. For, for a whole case. $750, not, yeah, per, per case, yeah, mm -hmm. for everything. That includes travel time to these mm -hmm. prisons out it in the does. middle of I think the way that's handled is you'll get a bunch of uh, cases that are all at the same institution, so your travel is, you know, Minimal. limited, but yes. But it's it like a public defender who has a ton of cases if you choose to accept, right? Well, that's another thing altogether. I think it yes. is in some cases worse than a public defender. And what's interesting is that almost all of these parole hearings, the DAs show up. The DAs have the budget and the priorities within the offices that they dedicate people to the parole process. So DAs show up frequently by video, but they show up, they prepare, and they make a case. Public defenders are not part of the parole process at all. Instead, it's this panel of attorneys who paid $750 per case. One idea, and of course, this is a money issue, is to say, just like the DA show up, public defenders should have a parole arm as well and basically eliminate this panel process. Now, a lot of work has gone into the panel process to train these people up into being experts in the process because it is complicated. That would have to kind of be transferred to the public defender responsibility. But right now, it is this panel system. I should also say that in a parole hearing, unlike a court case, 95% of the talking is done is the, by- I know, the, I know. Right. But I'm asking, you know why I'm asking the questions. Which is? No. Well, I'm being facetious. To poke holes in this system, to show how there's not a lot of equ equality between the sides. Or it's just heavily weighted on one side. I mean, right. it's, and then, it's and then, still an extension of to... due process, okay? Let's just be crystal clear. And you, if you're gonna keep this system, then how do you, which is what we're talking about, figure out a way to give more control to the person who's trying to get paroled? You know, you, I think it's important to put 
to give that person more control of their life and their future rather than having it still so heavily weighted on this board of strangers who don't know the person. Right. Who are afraid of letting out someone who's going to do something bad. I mean, well, that's, that, that's another thing you could, I mean, one could think about. It. I mean, now we're really thinking about the outside the box. Do we, do we protect the commissioners by statute? You could protect if that's what we're, if that's meaning what, we're, meaning protect the commissioners by statute in what way? What do you mean? From civil they liability. Can, from oh. civil liability or that their, their jobs are protected for Oh, is that their of, fear? Okay. Yes. I, I mean, if you're, or, yeah. or their job, I mean, I think jobs. it's a big thing. I think it's a big thing. You have these folks, they serve on the panel and the fear is, you know, I paroled Peter right. Espinosa. Has that ever happened? He, well, there's always a case. Okay, and we we we've, we've already we've already talked about the fact that lots of laws are based on fear. So we got to be honest about what people are afraid of and how so to protect. Could, it's it's like tenure for judge, you know, lifetime tenure for federal right. judges. You could say that a parole board's um, tenure is X years, you know, but for bad conduct, that might make people feel more protected. Well, I, I want to go to another because I don't want to discount that, but adding a bunch of other things, not that I'm against due process, but it seems like we, we would be adding expense and complication to something that's already very complicated and expensive. And I think it's worth it to revisit the presumption and whether we need to make some uh, changes in statute to, to reinforce the presumption of parole given certain cir circumstances and and a little bit lower the discretion uh, or the, okay. yeah. Uh, I agree, okay, so, sorry, Peter. Uh, so presumptions that we've discussed, I'm just trying to focus us a little bit are uh, the risk assessment presumptions, the sort of checklist presumptions, lack of rule violations could lead to presumptions, other issues, and then Peter, I don't know if you had, were on this thread, thread well, or no, had another. I, I was just going to say that it, it would be great to have these presumptions and a standard of proof to, to judge the, the evidence. I'm sorry, judge the decisions by, but I'm, I'm still struggling with a, a process that's not very balanced. Yeah. I don't understand how you can conduct a hearing where only one side gets to present evidence. If, if I'm understanding, and I don't really know anything about these parole hearings, other than when I used to review the parole denials, but I don't understand how you can justify a process that has implications as serious as this that doesn't allow both sides to present evidence. Well, both sides, the, the main presenter of the evidence is actually the parolee or the possible parolee. They are, well, they are, they, they are I mean, they are challenged. They're challenged with, okay, and based the, to oversimplify the way this goes is they say, okay, you committed this crime on X date. Uh, tell us what happened. Okay, t you, you committed this rule violation on X date. Tell us what happened. Um, and that's the way it kind of goes. So the, pers the, the rule violations and convictions are taken as given, as true. But they don't, so that's something also we could look into. And but sorry but to interrupt, but you raised the thing of the first I, point, which is that you committed X crime and you, and technically, technically our statutes are written as far as I understand them. And, and again, there may just be too much confusion or too much, too many additions that have left too much to interpretation where the parole board is not supposed to be weighing the initial crime. That's what you were sentenced for. The parole board is only supposed to be weighing what your behavior has been in prison and whether you are you still remain a risk to public safety. But that's they do what, ask about your your upbringing. Not, I mean, that's they not do... quite right. Here, let me share okay. the, share the screen again because they are told by statute, and this is something that could be amended, of course. So look at uh, 3041B, the gravity of the current offense is a statutory 
part of the decision making process. Ah, now when, okay, so when did 3041B1 come into play? Tom? I'll find out. Okay. But so are you saying it my seems judging? like that that uh, addition to the penal code in a way adds a lot more complication to the other parts of the penal code in that it you know it contradicts the issue of like above where shall meet with the inmate and normally grant parole right or the fact that um, the the next one 15 CCR where they should only be found unsuitable if they pose an unreasonable risk of danger if released versus what the underlying crime was. So 3041B1 seems contradictory to both the, the first one listed there and the last. All three don't, neither of, none of the three match, in my opinion, are really uh, congruent with each other. Mm -hmm. Or with case law. Right. Okay, that raises another question, not to change the subject. Uh, but it has been brought up about whether or not the judicial, judicial review, would it be helpful uh, here? Current law is that judicial review, and uh, Judge Espinoza, correct me if I'm wrong, is extraordinarily deferential to the underlying um, parole determination. If the parole board does something that's legally incorrect. If they flip a coin and say, uh, heads you're out, tails you lose, then obviously the court can step in. But the standard currently is if there is some evidence, or in other words, any evidence that supports the parole's determination, parole board's determination, that you're a risk to public safety, then it will be uh, approved. And any evidence or some evidence could be uh, uh, that the parole board thinks that there's lack of insight or lack of control, impulse control. So you could, we could by statute say that courts have a greater responsibility to review these um, all the way from reviewing de novo, which I think would be very difficult and problematic from a judge's perspective, reviewing for clear error. There's all sorts of legal standards that judges are kind of used to, to dealing with. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna kick it to you, uh, Judge Espinoza, if you think that courts should have a greater role to play here and would that be a significant impact? And if so, how might we uh, change the standard? Well, I'm not sure if I understand your question. I do know that if, if, a, if a, uh, someone who goes before the parole board is denied parole, they have an absolute right to file a habeas petition in the, in the sentencing court. Which, Correct, they have a right know, to file the, but the standard of review is very, very deferential. They could file a writ, that's that's not, it's some evidence. There's, is there any evidence that supports the parole board's decision? That's the I think, standard, yeah. that's Lawrence, right? Yes, and I think it would be helpful for courts who are reviewing habeas petitions to have a clear standard. Um, and I keep going back to this presumption of release and um, a burden of proof that's placed on the parole board that has a, some, you know, level of proof that's required. It would make it easier for judges to re have more independence in reviewing the habeas petitions. But I mean, I reviewed, I think in four years, hundreds of these things. And um, Michael, you know how frequently I um, reverse the parole board and um, and Governor Schwarzenegger during his term in office. And um, that process would be easier by more clearly defined rules at the parole hearing and a standard of proof. If that answers I also your have, I have, a, I have a question about a remedy and Judge Espinoza or Tom, I don't know if you know the answer to it. Can the court free the person or does it only, ha only have authority to send them back to the parole board? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Go ahead, Tom, because you, you're, you're first <laughs> well, of all, smarter I, I than me, and I've been, a, I've been away <laughs> for this for a while. decisions, Judge. I, I think, except uh, unless you could essentially so unshowable circumstances, you just get to go back for another hearing, which, and given how long a decision may take to come, might often be moot, depending upon how long your denial was. And Judge Espinosa, I'd also be interested to hear, I mean, in, in the hundreds that you reviewed, were most of them pro se? Were many of them counseled? Because I think that's the other thing is you don't have a lawyer 
to file a habeas like you do with your hearing. So that probably, you know, you know I just don't, a little bit too. It's been more than a decade. I don't remember. <laughs> I think they were primarily pro se. Once uh, you, were, once an, the answer is once you get an order to show cause, then you get an attorney for that. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I, I have um, a suggestion. Yeah. Can we ask staff? I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not the one to do this. But can you we only ask make staff the laws? Please? <laughs> yeah, I just make the laws. Anyway, um, and good, I have good partners. Anyway, can we ask staff to look at, you put on the, on up for us, those three parts of the penal code that are not in sync, okay? Can you review for us those and any others and draft something for us that would align them more? In other words, so that we, uh, if we are sort of coming from the point of view of that, if they, if we, what would you, if you were going to redraft, what would make them more internally consistent and more reflective of the case law, as, as Judge Espinosa pointed out. And that, let's look at what that would do, whatever that language is and what it might do, because that might be something, again, we have to see it that, for example, if these are, if these were not done by initiative, that the legislature might entertain, because it would be more in, uh, I mean, for example, we adopted this year, a change in the, um, uh, God, what was it, a change in enhancements for, because under realignment, we had not the uh, enhancements were passed before realignment. And in the statute regarding some enhancements, and this wasn't by proposition, this was done by the legislature, we you specified the language state prison. So under realignment and under Prop 47 and all, some of these underlying offenses were now jail offenses, but because the statute said state prison, the person was then forced to have to serve their time in state prison. So we just, all we did was remove those two words, state prison. So we left the enhancement alone. We removed the words and that put the person back in the county jail, which was consistent. So all we were doing is making something consistent with our, um, you know, with subsequent actions. So what I'd love to see, and it might be this simple, and I don't know yet, but I'd love to see is some language that was, that created a consistency between these and reflected the case law. And then let's look at what we think the implications of that are. I, I agree that that's a good first step. My concern is that we have three vague standards and by harmonizing them, we only just get now at least at least on harmonized standard, but it remains squishy terms. One thing that uh, I will note that I was gotten a note from staff while we were talking is that the California constitution has a standard for dangerousness that might be useful here for the bail context, but it's also a predictive one, which says, if a court finds by clear and convincing evidence of a substantial likelihood of great causing great bodily harm, then they should be denied bail or denied uh, pretrial relief. Mm -hmm. So you, I find it useful sometimes to borrow from other parts of the statute, but that would be like, you know, that they have to find by clear and convincing evidence uh, risk of to commit a, a violent crime. The reason why I like violent crime a little bit better is because there is the code again is very clear on what are crimes are violent and what crimes are not violent. So there's not a lot of wiggle room there. And there has to be a rational nexus and you could say that there has to be a rational nexus between them. And then that's when ju judicial review could come in and saying, no, there is no rational nexus between um, stealing a cookie from the, the canteen and, uh, and you know whatever violent crime. Could have them specify what violent crime that they might be concerned that they're committing. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, going back to, you know, I use just those um, three, but your point is the, we could do more than just making something consistent. We could look at the other aspects of whether constitution or otherwise that 
you know, they, they had a certain direction and which of these parole statutes in effect are in conflict with that and whether there's some tweaks to create a more, a more uniformity. That sometimes that can be sold easier to, I'm just using the example of my legislative colleagues, for example, than something that they consider a whole new change or a whole new, you know, that were instead we've identified these inconsistencies and we used this overriding principle and this aspect of the constitution as our first and foremost and then case law and others to come up with this proposal. I, I think that that sounds like a good next step. Um, I'm I, I don't want to cut off conversation prematurely but at the same time I'm trying going to try to move on. Let me try to summarize where we're at and tell me if I'm missing things that to add on, and this is basically giving homework to Tom and Rick and our team. So first of all, can we harmonize this, the statute and regulations and case law into one coherent, even sentence, or, right? Um, independent of that, can we, or look at standards what should the standard be? Should the standard be risk to commit violence? Again, uh, Secretary Schaefer, I mean, I keep on promoting her to secretary, but Jennifer Schaefer said that that's um, already kind of de facto the, the standard. Two, so that's, uh, excuse me, that's two. Three, um, are there presumptions that we can create to reduce the uh, subjectivity and increase predictability and perhaps incentivize the behavior that folk we, we hope that people would do in prison, including programming. Um, four, uh, standard of proof. Is that another area that we can? Um, and then uh, five, I don't know if we wanna put on there is changing or updating the judicial standard of proof, which is in, in zero statutes whatsoever, that is purely judge-made law, if, if I, unless I'm mistaken, but I think that that's correct. That is purely judge-made law. So there's no statute, the legislature has never weighed in on whether courts should weigh in on these and how they should, so. Um, those seem to be the five questions. Are there other areas that we, can and should think of as they continue to refine our ideas on parole release. On, on the first point, real quick, Mike, I would say, I think the, the Lawrence case is the harmonization of the regulations and the, and the case law. And that just talks about current dangerousness. So I really think the, um, the key thing for the committee to do is to change the underlying statutory language in the case law will, you know, be updated as, as new cases come down the road. I, I agree with that, but let's try to put in, if that is the case, then let's at least look at it. I think that yeah. Senator Skinner's just looking at it in a coherent way would be great. I think that Ms. Schaefer's um, reliance on the case law was, She's not controlled by the case law, and these is a, this isn't a constitutional decision. This is just an interpretation of the statute, which everybody is described as being muddled and inconsistent. So let's try to make it harmonized at the very least. Um, okay. Any further assignments for staff on this particular question? I may come up with some other things, but of course, this is not this, this, this is not your last. Nobody's last chance uh, to give Tom more work. And Rick, I see, I see you hiding there, Rick. So, okay, now I'm gonna change subjects to 1170D referrals, right? Uh, which again, we spend a lot of time on. In some ways I feel like they get a disproportionate attention because they're and truly there are so few cases. Part of me thinks like, Maybe we shouldn't spend any time on it at all. On the other hand, it does seem like a very promising opportunity as we try to encourage more second looks and 
more indeterminacy uh, and incentivizing people to do the right thing. So I think we should spend a little bit of time on it. So some of the ideas that had come up during our conversation were, and then uh, please jump in on any of them, um, establishing a more specific process. This comes from uh, Judge Cousins with uh, deadlines and perhaps requiring a hearing at any time somebody is recommended by uh, CDCR, DA, or sheriff for a reduced, reduced sentence. Second idea, again, presumptions. If you are recommended for a new sentence by law enforcement, should there be a legal presumption, rebuttable, of course, all these presumptions are rebuttable, they're not meant to be commandments, but that the courts must should follow that presumption. Third idea, and this was uh, basically copying Cory Booker's idea from the federal uh, proposal bill that was not passed, but actually part of First Step Act, so it's kind of half passed, but in any event, I, I, I was encouraged that Judge Cousins thought that this was a good idea. Um, I'm curious what Judge Espinoza thinks and also Judicial Counsel, that perhaps everybody after X years gets to petition for a new, a second look. That it's a lot of people, huge administrative burden, no attorneys, but do we have to rely on CDCR to do it? Because right now they're not, they're barely doing it at all. And then third, which I think is probably the easiest fix, but I think is, would definitely help things is that we could probably help uh, facilitate the uh, transfer and information and data between the state agencies, CDCR and law enforcement partners. Um, because it's, it, as um, we heard yesterday, it can be very difficult to get these documents and data from CDCR down to the local counties. And, and for security and law enforcement purposes, I don't think that there should be any reason why prosecution offices should be uh, prevented from or having big obstacles from getting that information. So those are the ideas that I wrote down from 1170D. I don't know if other people have others, but those are the, anybody have reflection on those four? I just wanted to add one that I think we talked about yesterday, which was sure. creating financial incentives for local prosecutors to stand up units that are charged with, you know, reviewing these, um, reviewing these requests. Yeah, I mean, um, we've thought about that. Do we want to pay? Yes, agreed. Or, you know, you can do it truly like 678, which is the more people you get resentenced, the more money you get, not just standing up a unit. Right. I mean, I didn't want to be crass, but it seems to me that you should incentivize the, the success of the process as well. But I don't, I don't know how you write yeah, that into the statute. Well, 678 did it. There's a lot of feelings about 678 in, in Sacramento, but I agree that it's crass. Um, Mike, and I, maybe I didn't pay enough attention to the first ones you outlined, but what if, what if on, oh, we considered that for the 1170Ds, rather than them going back to the original judge or the original prosecutor, that there be a, a panel, a judicial panel set up to review those. So then it's so not like the judge having to overturn their own ruling, but rather, uh, you know, if there has, to, if there's going to be a judicial process in it, that it's a uh, whatever independent panel that looks at because the 1170Ds are pretty much mostly CDCR, not only, but and uh, uh, they've already, you know, gone a pretty big threshold to even get recommended on that level. So I have a couple of thoughts about that, and actually Tom and I spoke about this this morning. So you could establish sort of a statewide court. Right. You could even say superior court judges shall be nominated. You know, the chief justice nominates five people. They develop an expertise. There's consistency. You learn about all the 
prison rules and that every recommendation goes to this group and they get the chance to uh, resentence people. Um, a couple of co concerns that I have with that. Um, first of all, it's creating a whole new bureaucracy. It's basically creating a new parole board. Well, if you go too big, if you just say, you know, there's going to be the judicial council will designate blank, these two judges or these three judges. So there's not that many 1170 Ds. We don't need to make this so complicated, right? Sure, there but it's, a no, it's another parole board. It's the same problem as the parole board. Also, well, okay, so now you get resentenced. But, but wait, 1170 Ds don't go to the parole board. Correct, but I'm saying we create another, you essentially are creating another parole board. Well, you're sending them to a judge now who already made one decision and it's kind of human, not, not saying all judges are like that, but it's kind of human to stick to your original decision. Yeah, but I think the data is backwards. I think I agree that that's the intuitive thing. We've, I've, we've done almost all of the successful 1170Ds. Okay. First of all, almost all the judges are no longer on the bench. Right, okay. almost all of these cases are old cases. People have served twenty plus right. years, yes. so it's uncommon that if your case goes back, that it goes to through the original judge. Okay, to the, just because they're not there. Okay, so I think that's not a. And in fact, sometimes when you do go back to the original judge, they're like very grateful. Now we could are say you? specifically you're not allowed to, or you could say to the inmate, you get to choose, or you could right. give it to well, the presiding go judge in a different way. What mm -hmm. look, there are not very many 1170Ds recommended in the first place. And of those, very few actually succeed. So if we if we assume, and I'm going to assume right now, that already the threshold to even get recommended for an 1170D is pretty high. Correct. How do we then create the next step so that it's a next step that already is assuming that this that a big threshold was met? Well, that's what I was saying that you could you could create. So, what? So I was saying you could create a presumption that if you're referred by law enforcement for a reduction of sentence, that the judge shall grant that absent ex okay. extenuating right. circumstances. I get it. Okay, I would I be supportive of that. I, I mean, it, I don't love the 1170D process that much because it's kind of, I mean, all of these things, so many of these things are very arbitrary, but at least within that arbitrary process, it creates a little more certainty, but go ahead, Judge Espinoza. Well, I was just going to say, I think that it's unlikely that judges in 58 counties, some of them very conservative, are going to easily give up the right to review their own cases to some centralized body. But I think that if you direct each county to designate one or two judges to review these cases, develop the expertise, to be trained on, um, on how these decisions are made by um, it's something like that. I just think it'll be an easier sell than, than the idea of creating a new body, centralized body to review cases from 58 counties. Um, and yeah, I would agree I with know. the judge. I was, part of me was thinking, what if we had some sort of like you know, double blind process with judges. Um, and then part of me was sort of reflecting on what um, George Gascon talked about, about in Portugal, how they have, you know, you can take the judge's track or the prosecutor's track, but if there's some sort of training or professionalism, that professional development that's provided for this, these scenarios, um, that maybe that's something to think about. But I mean, if you had two sets of judges, I guess sort of similar to what Judge Espinosa just offered up, that there's, you know, and then you, if it's double blind, then you look at what has come out of, you know, both of those evaluations and you might get some sort of cross currency. So I think the whole notion of the training of judges, which Gascon was going, I think is worthy of some discussion and visiting, but I think, while there's, I don't disagree, um, Judge Espinosa, with the merits of what you're recommending, but there are so few 1170Ds. If we go to the trouble of 58 counties of designating two judges in each county and training those two judges, it's a lot of effort and a lot of work for a very little result because there's counties that won't even have 1170Ds. So given that it's a very finite population, I think we have to do the simplest thing possible. And I think the presumption is the more, is the simpler. I, 
I'm going to sort of contradict some of my own previous direction here and ask more of a global question. I'm going to put you on the spot, uh, Judge Espinoza, to talk for all trial judges across the universe. You ready? <laughs> no. Okay. I have this idea. That, that, that person, by the way, doesn't exist. Yeah, no, the the I, one I, judge that can speak for all trial judges. Oh, I, I'm being ahead. facetious. But yeah. here's, here's the thing. As somebody who practices in a post-conviction context, I feel that judges, but also DAs and public defenders to a certain degree, have very little understanding and appreciation for what happens after court, right? Their sentence is person, five years, 10 years, life, whatever, goodbye, next case. And that lack of appreciation has a psychic disconnect that is detrimental to the system, which we are have been describing and seeing here as being more of an ecosystem. If there were all judges had the opportunity or the experience of getting these cases back, if, and if you sentenced somebody to 10 years, but you knew in eight, they had a chance to come back to you, do you think that that might change people's initial sentencing decisions and thinking about punishment in a beneficial way, or am I being too abstract here? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think I understand what you're trying to say and I'll, I'll try to answer it this way. In Los Angeles County, because we have 500 bench officers or, or we have 280 judges hearing criminal cases on any given day, the, the notion that this work should be centralized in front of one judge, um, became very popular. We, we centralized the, the parole habeas process. We centralized Prop 36. We centralized um, other things um, so that we could develop some expertise and consistency uh, with that one judge. Um, we, there was not, it was rare that we got pushback from judges um, who had originally sentenced from time to time we would hear from someone and said, hey, I understand you're considering, I want the case back. But generally judges were happy to have other judges reviewing, another judge reviewing the request for relief. I think that if you, if you do create a, an expectation that a, that a judge who's imposing a sentence at a, at a given moment may have the opportunity to reconsider that sentence in eight years, it might actually impact the sentences that are being posed, imposed. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna try to speak for 280 judges in Los Angeles County that are hearing criminal cases today, let alone all the judges in the state. But I, I guess my answer to your question is, I don't really know, Michael. Okay, I, I will just say about the centralized process, it does definitely create an expertise, but as somebody who uh, has been litigating Prop 36 cases, it was enacted in 2012, to, and I'm doing it to this day because there's only one judge handling it in LA County. You know, it it's, creates a backlog. Got it. Um, Fair how, point. About the, how about the idea of um, establishing more of a process? So right now there's no process. Do you have to have a hearing? Do you get right to counsel? Do you, does the judge have to write a written decision? Is there a certain amount of days that they have to make a determination? Um, almost half of all the recommendations, this is in part due to the fact that there are retired judges and there, there are some bureaucratic wrinkles to iron out, go completely unanswered by the judges. They just sit there because there's nothing in the statute that says that they have to do anything. So should we, goose things along by saying, hey, you have a deadline to do something. Yeah, I mean, I well, think- Well, that would just create more denials and we'll be in I don't, know, I don't know that it'll create more denials, but it'll certainly give teeth to the remedy. I mean, it's really a right without a remedy if the judge isn't required to respond to the petition. I know I'm not speaking for all judges now because um, I'm just saying, yeah, I think, I think that if we're going to allow people to petition the court for resentencing, that there should be some expectation that, there, that a response is required. We can talk all day about you know, what that response would look like, but I, I would say, yeah, I mean. Some, some more process. How about yeah. right to counsel? 
Now that's going to get into pocketbook stuff, but. Well, I mean, I think that the, I, again, I don't want to speak for the entire justice system, but I, I wonder if we should um, consider the possibility that this becomes a public defender responsibility. Once the case comes back, if the, if the person was represented by the public defender or is indigent now, um, maybe maybe it becomes their responsibility to, to do this part of the work. Anybody have other thoughts on that? The process piece. All right, the, the big wrench in that, however, or is also, there seem to be some interest in anybody gets to ask for a new sentence after, you know, a second look after, I don't know, let's call it 15 years just for the sake of conversation right now. You're gonna give everybody, I mean, first of all, do we like that idea? And second, do they get the same amount of process that somebody who's recommended by CDCR gets? So let's get to the first question first creating some sort of second look opportunity under 1170D. So right now only the CDCR, the parole board, DAs and sheriffs can ask for a recall of sentence. The First Step Act, which was passed by, you know, Trump and Republican Congress allows federal prisoners to ask. Now judges can dismiss those at him, but at least allows them to file. Mm -hmm. So would it be think? where they had to file or would we just have a presumption that it would automatically be re-looked at, at it? It seems to me we should have the automatic relook because it, So after 15 years, have, judge, every case comes back to court after 15 years. Only because we don't have adequate uh, legal assistance and many, many, many of these people do not have the resources to get that. Um, legal, uh, proper legal counsel to even file. Tom, we run into a lot of initiatives here, right? I, I mean, I think for the, the, the longer the sentence, the more initiatives we run into, let me put it that way. So if we're trying to really reduce those long sentences, we, we run in, into problems with, um, you know, where there's mandatory sentences that have to be imposed and judges don't have the discretion to strike anything under 1385 for um, you know, the most serious offenses a lot of the time. But could, right up, uh, currently 1170D does not prevent resentencing. There's no exception. I think death penalty cases might be accepted, or there's debate about whether death penalty, but but three strike sentences certainly, which was passed by initiative, of course, uh, can go back for resentences and can be recalled on the recommendation of CDCR. Judge Skinner is saying, could we write into 1170D? Oh, Judge, did I just promote you to or demote you or I reappointed you? And you and you said you weren't even a lawyer. Uh, so Senator Skinner is saying, after 15 years. Um, a petition is automatically filed under 1170D for recall of sentence. Would that interrupt three strikes? Right. No, I, I think because you're, if you're, you know, 1170D says you're in the position you would be if you were never sentenced. So for a, a three strike sentence to be changed, and correct me if I'm wrong, the judge is technically striking the strikes under 1385 and then imposing a sentence. So there's restrictions on stuff that can be struck. Even if the sentence is recalled, judge wants to resentence, those restrictions on, on that would prevent it. You don't automatically get something lower just because your sentence is recalled. Okay, right, so the judge could recall it for under 1170D. I mean, there's the 100, currently as of the 120 deadline, that could be just eliminated altogether, right? The judge could recall it at any time. That wouldn't seem to be an interference with the initiative process. Right. Uh, okay. Well, what do we think about this second look 15? This is a this is a big one. Second look after 15 years, whether it's by initiated by the petitioner or some sort of automatic trigger. Well, it seems to me we shouldn't just do a second if we're gonna do the concept of second look, and it depends on what else 
then it seems to me that we need to do a second look. Certain categories of crimes say a second look at 10 years because the 15, even the 15 seems semi-arbitrary. The data would indicate that, and again, this is where the data would be helpful, but you know, there's a certain number of years that beyond which does not give us much public safety benefit at all. And I don't think that, I think it's below 15. So if we're um, trying to look at, I don't want, I guess I don't want to embrace a reform that is semi-arbitrary that yes, reduces our sentences and reduces to a degree some level of our incarceration, but is still not based on that issue of what does the data show us is the amount of time after which there's really not that great of public safety outcome. I agree. 15 years was the, just for the sake of the conversation. Also, okay. we, should, we should note the vast majority of sentences are too short to even have a second look period anyway, right? The vast, vast majority of sentences, you, we don't have enough time the vast to even- majority of sentences, but the, but the majority of people sitting in the prison at any given time are the long sentences. Mm, sh the shorter than we might think, but well, in any event, I regardless. Looking at the numbers, there's like 40,000 some odd and whatever. It's but, uh, we could, but we need the data. Let's just put it that right. way. But this is just for sake of our argument. You're right. We could create tiers or whatever. But a second look, whether it's statutory, that is through this 1170D process, mm -hmm. where judges get to come back into the to re to get to reevaluate a sentence. Just they guess, just get, get, get. Now, my concern, and again, I don't know how this works. I think that there are a few other states that have this. You might correct me if I'm wrong. If a judge would have given seven years, but instead says, I'm going to give 10 and I'll see you in five, and maybe I'll change my mind in five years. Maybe we're okay with that. All right, maybe I'll ask this all question a different way. How do we feel about giving some kind of second look to everybody, perhaps on some tiered system, we'll, we'll try to use the data to figure out an appropriate number that makes sense. But let's put aside the when that date gets triggered. But instead of relying on CDCR to recommend that just it becomes automatic after a certain period of time. Can, can we substitute um, a percentage of the sentence for a period of time? Per, that, that's a very good idea. Yes, but I just want to try to, uh, I'm trying to wish that part of the problem away. But yes, yeah, so you could say after 50% or whatever, or 70, whatever we want. I mean, this is analogous to what judges frequently say when they put people on probation. I'm putting you on probation for a period of three or five years. However, in 18 months, you want to come back and you've been doing really well, I'll consider an early termination of your probation. So, I mean, this is analogous to that. It's obviously not exactly the same. But but I didn't, I didn't realize that. It's, I think people dismiss probation as being like this, like, casual thing. But it's the vast majority of punishments anyway. So judges it are already It is the vast doing... majority of punishment, and it really restricts people's ability to reenter successfully in many ways because you know your your ability to work is is compromised by having to report to the probation officer on a regular basis i mean there's judges but I'm, I'm, I'm i'm not i'm not being critical of probation let me just say that here i think probation is a nice option for judges who are considering sentences um, i'm just saying there are there are ways to reduce the, the time that people are on probation it can be initiated by the probationer well, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that in the vast majority of sentences, judges are used to having this kind of second look opportunity. Now, not for the big sentences, right? but in the vast majority of sentences. And this goes to your point, Senator Skinner, about do we look at who's in prison today versus who's in prison over the course of the year, over the course of 10 years. So it seems like that there seems so, to be some interest in this. As Assemblymember Kamlager, Dove, you haven't weighed in on this except to nod, <laughs> but uh, thoughts? Um, just in agreeance with a lot of what 
I'm hearing in the discussion. I mean, I think there should be a presumption. I think we should be getting, um, you know, after a period of time, that's something that should be offered. I, I, once again, I sort of, my premise is how do we put more control over the future of these people in their own hands? And part of that is by sort of eliminating barriers around time, around who gets to make the decision and around what the criteria are. So I'm nodding because these series of discussions we've been having seem to be getting at some of that. Okay, so speaking of time, in the interest of time and trying to wrap things up in some way and to give some direction to staff, I've written down what I think are the ideas that we want further exploration of. Um, and not in, a not in particular order, just in the order that happens to be on my notepad. Establishing a better process for how to handle these cases once they're received. Including 11 hearings, 1170, 1170s, hearings, appointment of counsel, deadlines, that kind of thing. Two, presumption for law enforcement referrals. Three, second looks for everyone after X period of time, whether it's a tiered system or percentage of your sentence or something like that but a second look. Right. I think to a lesser extent, although there was some interest, we'd like to know some more about sort of financial incentives, if that can be a useful tool. And I think an easier fix that probably is not very controversial is making sure there's better access to the data and files between DAs and uh, CDCR. Anything that I missed? Yeah, um, the, you know, maybe some more on the financial tools because the, in a way we're, it's impossible, but we're trying to create something that's fair for everybody. And we already know from the data that the counties, that some counties send more people, number one, send some counties uh, sentence longer and send more people to prison proportionately than others. And some counties engage in diversion courts and you know alternative sentencing to far larger a degree than others. And so the more we can incentivize, I think counties, judges, DAs, to to uh, whatever to not incarcerate, I guess the more is. I mean, when we look at what is the most expensive and least favorable public safety outcome is incarceration, that we want to incentivize them to use everything else, every other tool in the toolbox before they use that one. And um, th that that may create more fairness than just sending back, uh, you know, this disproportionate to, to entities that already had disproportionate results in the first place. No, I think that's right. And obviously Keeley, when she came and spoke, she had a lot of um, interest in that. I would also add in the presumptions, I'm sorry I skipped this because I really think that it's important. If somebody's serving a sentence that would not be imposed today by, by operation of law, that that should yes. probably get a presumption too. Um, and on the enhancements to look right. at which, right, because- Yeah, any most, sentence. Right, most of the laws, some like felony murder, we allowed for the ability for someone to get recents. A lot of the others, we put it only perspective and we, right. at that we should be. Right. Um, the incentive piece I think is, you know, we could come up in almost every one of our proposals could have built in a financial incentive uh, aspect to it. So let's just add that to the, to the list here. Again, if it's we're talking about relatively small number of cases, the financial incentives of 100 cases in LA is not going to move the needle. But well, and they're probably not the ones we mostly have to financially incentivize either. Well, not anymore. Right. With, well, with, even with, to a degree, even before, just to be honest, 
when we look at the numbers? Well, let's look at the data because I think some of the data is surprising. Some of the data that I've collected over time is, you know, counterintuitive in some ways on the sentence lengths and who's been sentenced right. and mental illness and all sorts of things. Right. So I, I'm, this is maybe my umpteenth, you know, request for data. So. Yeah. Um, all right, those were the two big proposals. We just went for 90 minutes on that and we haven't even gotten to the old business. Um, everybody's still doing okay? All right, let's take um, a 10 minute break and then we're gonna hand it over to Tom and Tom is gonna walk through a slide presentation of eight ideas that we have in previous hearings identified as our priorities as he and staff and I continue to whittle those down into uh, discrete proposals, right? So I have, uh, so let's let's get back here at uh, 1250, 1250, so that's 12 minutes from now. So um, grab a bite and a cup of coffee and I'll see you soon. Thank you.